for joining us today for this exciting event. My name is Josh Stenberg. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Chinese Studies at the University of Sydney. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, uh, the traditional custodians of the land upon which University of Sydney is built, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. Equally, uh, I am myself, myself speaking from the uh, land of the Wangal people of the Eora Nation and would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, we are very excited to be presenting today uh, this event, South Flows the Pearl, Chinese Australian Voices, and excited to be um, hosting these three speakers. Uh, the uh, Talks in Chinese Humanities, of which this uh, um, talk is a part, are co-presented by the China Studies Center. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Yim King Zhang for her help on the technical side. Um, the Department of Chinese Studies at the University of Sydney, the Australian Society for Asian Humanities, and the Faculty of Art, Design, and Architecture at UNSW, also in Sydney. Um, I would uh, I'll pass on now uh, to introduce the speakers to Minerva Inwald, um, who is the Seminars uh, Officer of the Australian Society for Asian Humanities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, so yes, as Josh said, I'm the Seminars Office of the Australian Society for Asian Humanities. I'm also Judith Nielsen Postdoctoral Fellow in Contemporary Art at UNSW Sydney. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for this panel celebrating the publication of Mavis Gok Yen's South Flows the Pearl, Chinese Australian Voices, edited by Xiao Man Yen and Richard Horsburgh and published by Sydney University Press earlier this year in February. Um, it, a volume of oral history interviews with Chinese Australians collected by Mavis Gokyan, South Flows the Pearl, Chinese Australian Voices, records the struggles and successes of Chinese people in Australia in their own words. I'm going to briefly introduce our panel today. So just to let everyone know how the event is going to run, we'll have three speakers and then there'll be a brief time, um, about 10 minutes at the end, where we'll be open to questions. So our first panelist today is Richard Horsburgh, who is son-in-law of South Flows the Pearl author, Mavis Gok Yen. Together with his wife, Xiao Man Yen, Richard is the book's editor. He is a retired New South Wales public servant who in recent years has become an active community-based researcher into Chinese Australian history. Our second speaker will be Professor Cam Louie. Um, before serving as the Dean of Arts at Hong Kong University, Professor Louie was uh, professor of Chinese at the University of Queensland and Australian National University. He's taught in Nanjing, uh, Auckland and Murdoch universities. He studied at Sydney University, Chinese University of Hong Kong and Peking University, and has held um, professorial fellowships at the Center for Chinese Studies in Taipei and at, the NT and at NTU Singapore. He is currently an honorary professor at um, Hong Kong University and UNSW Sydney. He's served on government committees such as the Ch Australia China Council and in leadership roles such as the president of the Hong Kong Academy of Humanities and head of the Asian Studies section at the uh, Australian Humanities Academy. Um, Professor Liu wrote the foreword to South Flows the Pearl. Our final speaker today will be Dr. Sophie Loy Wilson, who is a historian of Chinese Australian communities um, in the Department of History at the University of Sydney. Her first book was a study of China-Australia relations in the interwar years, seen through the prism of Chinese Australian communities in Shanghai. Um, and Dr. Loy Wilson wrote um, an introduction to South Flows the Pearl. So I'll hand over now to our first speaker, Richard. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, everybody. And thank you to the uh, China Studies Center for the opportunity you've given Sophie, Cam and I to uh, give this presentation today. Um, as Minerva has said, my name is Richard Horsburgh and I am the son-in-law of Mavis Gokyen, the author of South Flows the Pearl. And together with my wife, Shaman Yen, uh, we have edited her mother's book. Um, I just want to point out at the start that neither Shaman or I are professional historians. So if we were to have a label, I guess we were keen family history researchers or community-based researchers. I'm going to speak a little bit today about the background story of the book and how it came to be. Uh, and then uh, Cam and uh, Sophie will share their perspectives on the book. So look, I'll just share my screen with you first, if I can do this properly. And uh, where are we? Here we are. And I'm going to do uh, any. Now, I, hopefully everybody can see that okay. Um, so um, what is South Flows the Pearl? The concept of the book is very simple as the subtitle, Chinese Australian Voices, 
suggests. It is 12 people, or in some cases couples, telling their, stamp, their family stories. Uh, it's all told in the first person, and it's based on oral history recordings made by Mavis Yen, which I'll uh, talk about in, in a moment. It's not an academic work. Mavis herself was not a professional historian. Uh, when she researched and wrote this book, uh, she was living on the old age pension here in Sydney, and she was living in government housing. She was part of the same community as the people she interviewed, and she was a similar age to them. She spoke Cantonese, and her family came from the Pearl River Delta area, as did the families of all the interviewees. Other than the introductory pieces by uh, Cam and Sophie in the book, um, Mavis did not attempt to provide any sort of overlaying analysis. Um, and it's really up to you as the reader to draw your own conclusions, uh, which separates it, I guess, from the approach that a professional historian would have taken uh, with such source material. So we can only speculate as to how much, you know, Mavis's background and her community associations influenced the creation of this uni unique work. So I'll just leave those initial thoughts with you. And I'd like to start on a, uh, uh, a personal story first. Um, five or six years ago, Shaman and I had a holiday in Perth, which is where uh, Mavis Gokian grew up. And while we were there, we visited the Australian Archives Office there to do a bit of research into her family history. So we had about a list of 10 or so family files we wanted to look at. And one of them we thought was just a simple file about a certificate of exemption for Shaman's auntie. But instead, it turned out to be the full family file, 169 pages long. Uh, this was like a eureka moment for us. We thought this was fantastic and uh, contained a, a, a great wealth of documents and photographs and all sorts of things that we'd, we'd never seen before. We spent most of the day photographing it as it hadn't been digitised at that stage. It is digitised now, actually. Um, but there's one crucial thing missing. Um, the file had a lot of facts and documents, which, of course, uh, are vital to any history. Um, but it didn't really tell you anything about the family at whatsoever. Um, the archival material like this, of course, was the, the government's view of the people it was surveilling. Um, so it's a top-down helicopter view, if you like, uh, of this particular family. But it doesn't tell you who they really are. You know, did they have a good life? What were their personalities? Uh, what was their home life like? Um, what did they do for enjoyment? Did they speak Chinese at home? Or did they celebrate Christmas? None of these sorts of things. So South Flows the Pearl is all about the other side of that coin, all the human bits and pieces that don't appear in the dusty files, but uh, complete the picture. So it's a, a ground level view, if you like, looking up as opposed to the, the top down view. And it does this in amazing detail, telling stories that have never been told before. As I said, the book features the lives of 12 Chinese Australians born between about 1894 and 1938. So if you just think for a minute that this book uh, contains an interview with someone born in 1894, which was quite miraculous, uh, the fact that this is now coming out in 2022. All the tape recordings were made by Mavis Yen, and she made them between 1987 and 1995. All but one of the interviewees have now passed away so this is a generation that has um, left us, uh, which makes this book unique in that it can never be replicated today. The parents and grandparents of the interviewees were all born and came to Australia uh, in the 1800s. They're all born in China, I should say, and came to Australia in the 1800s. So the interviewees had a direct link to uh, Chinese Australian history virtually going back to the gold rush days. They themselves described their life journey through the 20th century, living under the long years of the white Australia policy. At the end, they reflect on the lives of their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, 
are all with us today and are enjoying the benefits of living in multicultural Australia. So this cohort of interviewees are a pivotal generation in that they connect colonial Australia with uh, contemporary Australia. Mavis wove these stories together seamlessly so that the interviewee stories just come alive and, and jump out at you off the page. And we get to learn their personalities, learn their views about the world around them, appreciate their sense of humour and share the tragedies and successes of their lives. What I believe is exceptional and unique about South Coast the Fool is the scope and the depth of the material. In regard to the scope, the 12 stories come from all around Australia. Um, most community-based histories, I guess, are, are focused on one family or one particular location. But South Flows the Pearl has two stories from Western Australia, two from the Northern Territory, two from Queensland, one Sydney-based story, two regional New South Wales stories. As well, the interviewees uh, touch on stories from Bendigo, Brisbane, Broome, Cairns, and many other places across the nation. As well, a couple of the interviewees were actually born in China and uh, they relate their journeys to Australia and how they made their lives here. I'm not sure that this was Mavis's original intention in uh, writing the book, um, but I think as she found more and more interviewees, this, this broad scope just uh, fell into her lap and, and she ran with it. And. Um, just as two villages in China on opposite sides of a river can be uh, uh, very different to each other, so it is with the experiences of Chinese in Australia. They were never a monocultural group as the stereotype of the gold digger or the market gardener would suggest. Uh, the experiences of Chinese living and working in Darwin is completely different to the, the lives of those living in Sydney's Chinatown. And uh, even within one state, the experiences of Chinese in the arid far west Gulf country of Queensland uh, is completely different to the life on the lush eastern seaboard around Cairns. So this feature really stands out in South Flows the Pearl. The depth of the material is astounding. Uh, everyone Mavis interviewed could remember in the greatest detail the smallest elements of their lives. There is a wealth of storytelling in this book that will uh, just entrance the casual reader who just wants a, you know, a good read. A school student will learn about a different type of Australian history from reading this book. Uh, for a university PhD student, there is a wealth of self uh, source material here. And for the professional historian, South Flows the Pearl, there's a world they can keep on coming back to. And I've been advised by a couple of historians that they've also already uh, footnoted South Flows the Pearl in their, in their writing. So it's already been used for that purpose. So Shaman and I hope that this will be one of the lasting legacies of South Flows the Pearl. Uh, I'm going to feature just one part of one story just to whet your appetite for the book. This is the story of Albert Lee On, who has part Chinese and part Aboriginal heritage. Much valuable research work on Chinese Indigenous relations has already been done by Queensland based researchers like uh, um, Sandy Robb and Hilda McLean and um, some material has been published in books, particularly about outback Queensland around the Gulf country. But I still think it's fair to say that this is a fertile area for further research. And I was just advised yesterday of a new research project at the Chinese Museum in, uh, in Melbourne called our story, Aboriginal Chinese people in Australia. So that's a promising development. And just a warning that the next two slides contain photographs of First Nations people who have died. Albert Leon um, was born at Lawn Hill Cattle Station in the far west of Queensland in the Gulf Country in 1916. His grandfather was Sam Arbau, Ar and he leased the, uh, the vegetable garden at Lawn Hill. Now, Lawn Hill Station and the surrounding Gulf countries was uh, the scene of some appalling massacres and violence against uh, Indigenous peoples in the late 1800s. 
This included the capturing of young Aboriginal girls who was used as servants on the stations and often given to station employees as their partners. Albert's maternal grandmother was one such girl, although her relationship with Sam R. Beau and subsequent marriage to Sam uh, turned out to be quite successful and a long lasting one. She was a local midwife and in fact helped deliver her grandson, Albert, whose story is in the book. From what I understand, she also imparted traditional knowledge to her part Chinese children. Albert's mother, Lorna, was one of these children. Some of Lorna's older siblings were taken to China as children and never returned. So somewhere in China today, there are no doubt people with Australian Indigenous heritage. Lorna married Sam Lee On, who was about 30 years her senior and more the age of her own father. They moved to the small border town of Camelwheel soon after Albert was born, where Sam Lee On established a, a bakery. Albert quickly learned the harsh truth that both Aboriginal and Chinese people were at the bottom of the social scale and all that entails. This ingrained in him from an early age an awareness of injustice. So if we move forward now of a decade, a decade and a half, um, Albert finds himself in Sydney and mixing with a larger Chinese population for the first time. He gets a job on the Sydney wharves. He says he is the first Chinese wharfie in Sydney. He joins, uh, he joins the uh, maritime, uh, maritime Union and uh, becomes an organiser with the, 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 the union, which is a very left-wing organisation. He joins the Australian Communist Party. Uh, the Chinese, uh, the, the Maritime Union set up a, a sub-union called the Chinese Siemens Union formed by the, the likes of Fred Wong and Arthur Garlock Chang to look after the interests of Chinese and other Asian merchant seamen who were stranded in Australia during World War II. Post-war federal governments of all persuasions tried to deport these seamen. And, and uh, this and several other issues of the day led to consider, considerable union activity, uh, which Albert was a part of and brought them under notice of the ASIO or the security agencies of the day. Interesting enough, though, that uh, in all the various splits of the Communist Party in Australia in the 1950s and 1960s, Albert actually adhered to the, the Russian line, as he says in the book, uh, and did not approve the ideological direction of the Chinese Communist Party. So in Albert's story, we have um, witnessed the first hand of a very different kind of Chinese Australian experience to the stereotype of the gold digger, the market gardener, the storekeeper, the restaurant cook, and South Close the Pearl is crammed with these types of myth-busting uh, stories. But what about Mavis Dokian? As you will read in her brother Harry's story in the book, um, Mavis was born in Perth in 1916 to a Chinese father, William Gok Ming, and Anglo-Australian mother, Mabel Jenkins. The parents met when Mavis, uh, Mabel was teaching English to migrants uh, in a program run by her church and got, she and Gok Min uh, obviously hit it off. The irony of this story was that Mabel's church minister, while he was happy to try and get converts through the uh, English language program, uh, refused to marry them. So they took off to uh, Melbourne and uh, married there in 1910. In 1925, Mavis was taken to China as a child, along with her three siblings, first to Shanghai. Then they went back to William Gok Ming's ancestral village of Chuxiao Yuen in the Pearl River Delta. And then finally back to Shanghai where Mavis went to high school. Um, apologize for that, my phone's just ringing. I'll just turn that off. <laughs> These things always happen. Um, so uh, Mavis was working in Hong Kong when the, the Japanese occupied Hong Kong in 1941, and she actually. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll just have to take this phone out. So apologies. I'll be back. Ah, my apologies. These things always happen. 
uh, as I said, uh, Mavis was in uh, Hong Kong in 1941, the Japanese occupied, and uh, she actually escaped it by foot in an amazing journey into Free China. And she ended up in um, Chongqing, which was the Allied capital, where she worked for the embassy, the British embassy, for the rest of the war. In 1946, Mavis moved to Shanghai and she worked for the Chinese Industrial Cooperative Movement, um, also known as Gung Ho, or the, which gave the expression Gung Ho to the, in the, the, into the English language. Uh, and this organisation was established by New Zealander Rui Ali, amongst others. Uh, and this is where she met her Chinese husband, Jeffrey Yen, who she married in 1950. During the 1950s, Mavis became an English language teacher in Beijing. and. Uh, during the uh, Cultural Revolution started in 1966, she was detained for two years on the campus before being sent to the countryside for the further two years. Mavis eventually returned to Australia in 1981 after three dec decades away, uh, bringing Shaman with her so Shaman could, could complete her education. As schools have been closed during the Cultural Revolution, uh, Shaman had had no secondary education at all uh, but uh, pleased to say that she successfully attained a university level qualifications in Australia. And of course, uh, this is where we both met. Mavis had no money when she came back to Australia. She lived on the old age pension, as I said, and then government housing, first in Canberra and then in Sydney. But she wasn't idle. Uh, at the age of 65, she enrolled in university and within five years, she had completed a Bachelor of Arts uh, majoring in professional writing and a graduate diploma in applied economics. In 1987, as I said, at the age of 71, she recorded her first oral history interview and so started on this epic project. After she completed her final interview in 1995, she spent the next five years or so constructing the manuscript uh, as you see it today. And she did this without any help at all, any other professional historian help. She just did this completely by herself off her own bat. So why did she undertake such a task at that stage of her life? Someone and I found this quote amongst her papers after she died in 2008. The idea of a study of the early Chinese presence in Australia first occurred to me during China's Cultural Revolution. I had been placed under house arrest in the second Peking Foreign Languages Institute, where I'd been teaching English, in order to produce an account of my life. The targets of attack had now been extended from old revolutionaries and intellectuals to include Chinese from overseas. How could the Chinese in Australia be seen as a threat to the security of the Chinese people? I asked myself. The flip side to this was the situation in Australia, which he had witnessed growing up firsthand in Perth. How could the Chinese who had come to Australia be actually seen as a threat by Australian authorities? So she embarked on this project over 45 hours of tape recordings that she made, writing them up first on her manual typewriter and later computer, refining and polishing them up until she was in her mid eighties before she finished the manuscript. A phenomenal achievement, was said, done completely by herself with no background as a historian and no academic help or peer review. To the everlasting regret, Mavis couldn't find a publisher. Uh, when she died in the age of 92 in 2008, I think you could say that by then she had given up on seeing the book in print. So this is where Shaman and I came into the picture. What we were left with when we tidied up Mavis's apartment were a couple of typed up versions of the manuscript, a cardboard box full of cassette tapes, more cardboard boxes uh, with all her paper, paper files in them, and a huge number of the old three inch floppy disks holding the original manuscript. Um, our computer couldn't read the floppy disks, uh, but fortunately our computer repairman had an old computer in his garage which he uh, rigged up and gave to Shaman, and she was able to retrieve the files. Um, Mavis had a few photographs from her interviewees, but many were of poor quality. 
So our next step was actually to find the families. As I said, all the interviewees, but one had passed away and they were scattered all over the country. Um, so it took an amazing amount of detective work for Shaman and I, and a lot of luck over the course of the next several years, but we were able to track them all down, except for, for uh, about one. So all the families have been marvellous. We were a bit, we had a bit of trepidation as to whether they'd be happy with the, these family stories coming up, but um, they, they've been fantastic providing more photos and giving us more background about their family. Um, one takeaway for us is, is how much Chinese Australian family history uh, photos and objects are still out there sitting in boxes in, in garages. Um, so, and it's great to see that there's a renewed interest now in Chinese Australian history and collectively we all need to ensure that this history is preserved. We had a workable manuscript, but we had to find out if it was any good. So our next step was try and validate it. Um, Shaman and I had no publishing experience or no connections in the book publishing world at all. We took a slightly different approach to Mavis. We didn't approach publishers. Uh, at the end of 2014, we went to a talk about Chinese Australian women in Australia given by historian Kate Bagnall in Sydney. We bailed her up afterwards and followed up with an email, but Kate was living in Canberra at the time, so she passed this on to a young historian at Sydney University, Sophie Lloyd Wilson, who at that time was a humble postdoctoral research fellow. So we met Sophie and she agreed to help us and uh, a few years intervened and we kept in touch and Sophie was crucial uh, in us approaching Sydney University Press to get the book published. And more importantly, of course, she's written the most uh, wonderful introduction uh, to the book and we are forever in her debt for that. And then we met uh, historian Michael Williams, who's also a great promoter and supporter of Chinese Australian history. And currently he's uh, embarking on a retracing the walk from Rogue to the Victorian goldfield. So that is an interesting expedition he's on at the moment. Um, so Michael encouraged us to apply for a New South Wales Heritage Grant, which we did, and uh, that has helped us uh, certainly uh, along the way in getting this book published. Uh, he also, uh, suggested that um, Cam Louie might be someone uh, who could do a, the forward for the book with us. Um, so we were very pleased about that suggestion because uh, Cam on Cam Louie's mother's side of his family are descended from the same Chuxau uh, UN Gok clan village as Mavis's family is. Plus Shaman and Cam both remember that in the late 1970s in Beijing, Cam visited Mavis and Shaman at their home. So. We thought this was a, a perfect uh, end to the circle and uh, it led us back to the village and, and to Mavis. Well, I believe that um, South Flows the Pearl, one of the most remarkable journeys in Australian uh, uh, publishing, uh, conceived in the 1960s, researched in the 1980s, written in the 1990s and 2000s, and now published at last in 2022. Uh, this is Mavis Scott. Yen's gift to us all. It's all her conception, inspired by the life experience that uh, she had that equipped her with the skills and the capacity to um, undertake the research and uh, do the field recordings and then to have the creative flair to write the book. This is the book that could easily have been lost for all time, but uh, is now here in all its glory. It's a book completed 20 years ago, but in fact is, is, is quite timeless. So uh, thank you again for all for your interest. And I hope you have many hours of enjoyable reading with South Flows the Pearl. And uh, we hope you'll agree that's a very valuable addition to what we know about the wonderful story of Chinese in Australia. And now I'm going to give a plug. Of course, you can order South Flows the Pearl directly from Sydney University Press, or you can buy it through the usual bookshops and online distributors. Um, and there's an ebook version available. As a special thank you to joining us today, Sydney University Press is giving a 20% discount for all the attendees who order directly from Sydney University Press, just go to their website up to 10th of April. So um, if you enter the code SFP for South Close the Pool, SFP CSSC, sorry, <laughs> SFP CSC in the discount box at the checkout, and you can obtain that 20% uh, discount. So I think I'm going to now hand you over to Cam Louie. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Richard. So we now have our next speaker. Um, so Cam, when you're ready, if you just um, like to go ahead, thanks. I think you might be muted, sorry. Let's try it again. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank Richard and Xiaoman for inviting me to contribute towards this wonderful book, Sales Throws the Pearl. My contribution is minor, I only wrote the foreword, which is only a couple of pages long. Um, but I really learned a lot from it and uh, about the life of uh, Chinese Australians during the White Australia policy days. I only knew a few of the people personally, and uh, sadly, most of them have passed away. But the author, Mei Yan, has kept them alive in the recordings. In reading the manuscript, I also like the meticulous editing and annotating that uh, Richard and Xiaoman have done, and Sophie's informative introduction that provides a comprehensive historical background. The book is full of interesting and insightful details about what it was like um, for Chinese in the early part of the last century, moving between small villages and districts such as Zhongshan and outback Queensland, as well as big cities such as Hong Kong and Sydney. There are simply too many fascinating personal and social, uh, social dramas for me to recount in 15 minutes. So I'll concentrate on only one aspect of their lives. As I said in my foreword, the, the uh, memories recorded in this book are a timely reminder that even during the xenophobic days of white Australia and political chaos in the anti-Japanese and civil wars in China, basic humanity prevailed. No matter how demanding a situation they find themselves in, people mostly just want good food, harmonious family life and safe social networks in which to live. I have therefore decided to concentrate on food and show how it relates to family life and social networks as remembered by the people in the book. Food is something we all appreciate and cannot do without. And we tend to remember what we ate around the dinner table when we were kids. The taste of particular dishes cooked by their parents remain with children for life. For Chinese Australians, um, the smell and flavors of food at home are often very different to what they buy in school canteens. I have very limited time, so I'll cite from just a few characters from the book and what they remember of eating habits in Australia and China. And as much as possible, I'll let them do the talking. So I'll beam up all quotations from the book onto the screen. I'll start with Mei Wiz Yan's um, older brother, Harry Ming, who was born in Perth in 1911. Harry's father, Gok Ming, was, was Australian Chinese and his mother, Mabel Jenkins, was Anglo-Australian. He remembers his, his mother as an excellent cook, but, but she only made Australian meals, and I quote, she baked dinners in the fuel stove, cooked stews and fried steak. She baked all her own cakes, made us a variety of baked custards with rice, bread and butter, sago and tapioca. But Harry took Chinese food, took the Chinese food more. Interestingly, he said that he learned table manners from his father. And the way it was taught was common for many Chinese in traditional China. And Harry remembers it well, and I quote again. I learned my table manners from, from dad. Once I was sitting at the table, my rice bowl on the table and my left hand hanging it down my side. I was using my chopsticks in my right hand. All of a sudden, dad growled. Is your left hand crippled? I lifted up my left hand and said, no, it's all right. Then pick up your bowl and hold it when you eat, he ordered. Another time I was busy picking out all the tidbits on the table and ne neglecting to eat my rice. Suddenly dad reversed his chopsticks and hit me across the knuckles with them. And ate one mouthful from the table and one mouthful of rice, he said. To this day, I automatically did so. Harry also went back to Zhongshan, his father's hometown. And there he talks about his aunt and I quote, Sam Bangmu, who did the cooking and for, for that matter, the lion's share of the housework as she didn't have bound feet. She was a most unfortunate woman. When I was young, our Paul had insisted that dad sent his older brother, Hoi, 
back to China to get married. Dad had provided the money to find, a Hoi, to find Hoi a wife, pay for the wedding expenses, and threw his mother enough money to live on for two years. Then Dad sent Hoi his fare back to Sydney, but after Hoi left his wife with a baby girl, she never saw or heard from him again. Eventually, he died in Sydney, and Sambapu was provided for by Dad for the rest of her life. She had to carry the drinking water from the mountain spring, gather and carry all the grass fuel, as well as do all the housework. This little account of the fate of some bamboo is sad, but very telling. For those of you who have read the book, Poison, Poison of Polygamy, also published by Sydney University Press, will remember that the biggest fear for wives back in China is that their men folk take up gambling and somehow do not provide for those left behind. I myself know of several cases where this happened. As well as the humiliation this brings, the families literally face starvation. The fear of their husbands wandering off overseas and neglecting, neglecting the, sell, the left behind wife was so great that one of the most well-known no, well landmarks in Hong Kong called the Ah Ma Rock in English is a rock formation that looks like a woman carrying a child looking out to sea. It is said that her husband went abroad when the child was born, but never returned. She stood there in wind and rain and waited for him to return until the goddess Wan Yin was so moved such that she turned the rock, she turned her into a rock, the Mong Fu Sack, meaning literally the waiting for husband rock. Well, she's waited for over hundred years now and she, she still has not, hasn't returned. As you know, in the 19th and early 20th century, there were very few Chinese women in, in Australia. Most Chinese here were single men or men who have had to leave their wives behind. The interviewees in this book are in some ways very unusual because nearly half of them, half of them are women and all of them have spouses in Australia. And most of them talk about their parents and enjoy some sort of family life. Remarkably, Having a wife out here in Australia didn't mean that the men did no housework. Hoi Lee, who like Harry was yeah, born in so 1911. Sorry to bother you. You haven't shared your screen. Sorry, Richard and I just need to tell you, no, you haven't, you've got to share your, um, share your PowerPoint. Sorry, sorry, oh. Cam, so sorry. I thought I've shared it. Uh, I, 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 I'm so far, <laughs> so, so, sorry, so Cam. far advanced now. Um, can you understand me anyway? I'll just keep going. Yes, it's great, yes. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just keep going. Remarkably, having a wife out here in Australia didn't mean that the men did no housework. Hoi Lee, who, like Harry, was born in 1911 in Australia and who grew up in New South Wales country, uh, country town, Wellington, recalls that my mother had bound feet. She was not able to do anything, so my father had a pretty hard life too. He had to open the shop at half past seven in the morning. In those days in the country town, you sold everything and everything, grocery, um, vegetable, some hardware, or a bit of drapery. As well as minding the shop, Hoi Lee also remembers that my father did all the cooking because he used to be, cook, to be the cook in Fong Lee in Wellington. Being Chinese, he cooked us a lot a hot breakfast, either rice porridge or rice. We had no lunch, but we had a cooked tea. You wouldn't get your tea till he closed the shop though. Finally, I don't think the dishes his father served were particularly tasty or authentically Chinese, because when he cooks a Chinese meal, and I quote again, he would open a tin of corned beef and cook it with whatever vegetables were available. You had everything in tins. He cooked an open fireplace inside the house. There was a fire down below and two bars of steel across the top. You put your pan, your, your pot on the two bars. Needless to say, his father's cooking was pretty basic. By contrast, even though Hoi claimed that his, his mother didn't do any of the housework, it was his mother's cooking that he remembered most fondly. For example, he says that in those days, you could not even buy ground, up, down, ground rice. My mother used to grind the rice herself. With brown feet, she wasn't able to get around much, but she would sit and turn a millstone. I think whatever she, whenever she was in the mood, she would make rice flour dim sims for us. And he also says that we didn't celebrate the dragon boat, the, the uh, Don, Don Wujie, the dragon boat festival, but we would have sticky rice puddings, which was, which are supposed to have then. My mother always looked after that type of thing. 
Lots of times it may not have been the day or, or the occasion, just when we had the stuff to do it. I'm sure those of you who are of Chinese descent will remember the yummy glutinous rice dumplings that we would eat around the Dragon Boat Festival. This brings me to the other topic that I wanted to highlight from this recollection for the Australian Chinese. Talking about food often leads to memories of family life around the dining table or festivals where delicious snacks or banquets were served. Memories of food therefore often generate feelings of family gatherings and the interviewees often recall a festival such as mid-autumn, Chinese New Year and a tomb swooping, swooping festival, the Qingming Jie when special foods were consumed. It's interesting that Hoi remembers it is his mother who would look after that type of thing and make the proper food for it if they had ingredients. One convention that Hoi also remembers is the roast pig that was often eaten at the funerals. Even in a country town like Wellington, there would have been relatively very few Chinese there. Yet the custom of honoring the departed by having a feast in the, cemetery, in the cemetery seemed to have been observed. Many of the interviewees seem to remember the uh, tomb stripping day, that is Qingming Festival, very well. For example, Evelyn Lowe, who was born in Sydney in 1922, recalls that, and I quote, that respected this tradition. He would take the special train going to Rookwood Cemetery on Sundays. We always took a lot of food with us char siu, siu up, you know, roast duck, instead of roast pork, cooked by my dad, and a boiled duck, uh, sorry, boiled chicken. The chicken had to be complete with gato, that is a chicken head uh, uh, intact. In Again, I'm sure scenes like this would bring back, uh, sorry, I'll keep, re I'll keep reading. Um, we, carry, we carry all the food to the grave and met up with others, um, um, like Hansman, that is her, her, her families. They also brought roast ducks and other food along, packets of red candles and joysticks. We went from grave to grave, but each grave, we laid out all the food in front of the tombstone, lit incense and red candles and burned paper money. Before each grave, we placed three sets of chopsticks, three little bowls of rice and three cups of, of jiao, that is wine. It has to be free of everything. This was because an odd number can't be divided and thus continuity is ensured for the family. The rice and wine we tipped out and left, there, and left there. They used to say it was a meal to replenish the body. My father didn't drink, so we took the Coca-Cola instead of wine. Sometimes we left firecrackers and sometimes we didn't. After that, we moved the food away from the graves and had a picnic of it. Again, I'm sure scenes like this will bring back many memories for many of you. The Qingming, Qingming Festival is so enduring amongst Australian Chinese that even my nephews and nieces, who are effectively fourth generation Australians, know the custom, uh, customary routine. Ironically, because I left Sydney in 1975 and had not been in Brookwood Cemetery for several decades, by the time I came back to, to Sydney a, a few years back, I had forgotten many of the details. Thank God for the younger generations and thank God that books like this mean we can read about what previous generations did. In any case, what I found amusing about Evelyn Lowe's account is a statement that my father didn't drink, so we took Coca-Cola instead of wine. I must confess that for the first time I saw this can-do alteration of traditional customs was when one time I saw a father and son worshiping not far from my grandfather's grave and not, on, not only Coca-Cola instead of wine, but Kentucky chicken, in chicken instead of uh, boiled chicken with the head intact. I wonder what their grandfather thought. I was amused, but also full of, of, of admiration for the way Chinese Australians have been able to make do and invent new, new conventions. The books South Throws the Pearl shows that the world is changing and what matters is not what we eat or who we are, or who we keep as company, but how we remember these fundamental human activities. I believe Mabel Zhan has done a wonderful job in drawing out and decoding the, of the, of, and recording the memories of the Chinese Australians over a generation. After all, even if we don't have the same experiences, we still recognize the aroma and the taste of food we consume with our families. Before I finish, I should say, buy the book for yourself, your children or grandchildren. 
and may you enjoy many fantastic ban banquets with family and friends. Which reminds me, it's Qingming time now, so perhaps I'll see some of you at Vukwa Cemetery. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Cam. That was that was great. Um, we'll now move on to Sophie Loy Wilson, who will wind up our panel today. Thanks so much, uh, Minerva and Josh, and thank you so much to Ping and all the staff at the China Study Centre for organising uh, this event for us. Um, I'm so honoured to follow on from Richard and Cam. I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to acknowledge any Indigenous people here, um, including elders past, present and emerging. So as a uh, um, Dr. Minerva Inwald said, my name is Sophie Loy Wilson and I'm a senior lecturer here in Australian history at the University of Sydney. It has been a great privilege to be part of this project and to be invited to be part of this project by Richard uh, and Shaman. Um, the project of finally publishing Mavis Gokyan's groundbreaking work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the introduction for this book and I want to put forward a very simple idea while doing so. This is the idea that this is not just a Chinese Australian history book. This is a book that radically challenges how we see history more generally, and in particular, how we write history um, in the nation of Australia. I believe this is a book that gets to the heart of what it means to identify as Australian. It's hard for me to convey to you, I think, the, the magic um, of Mavis Gokian's work. I think that part of what makes her Chinese Australian history so good is that she captured the whole span of her subject's life experiences. She conducted multiple interviews and she read widely in both Chinese and Australian history. And of course, as you've heard, she lived through much of it herself. Like Mavis, her interviewees have mostly passed on now, women and men who came of age in the 1930s and 1940s, who knew the landscape of interwar Australia, as well as they did that of Republican era China. They understood what it was like to work on a Chinese market garden in Manly or a Chinese shop in Perth, to cook in a Chinese kitchen in Haymarket or sweat on a sugarcane plantation in Queensland. But equally, they understood how to gather fuel for the fire in the village of Tuk Sao Yen, or how to run a small temple in a fishing village of Corleone outside Macau, or how to square accounts for the Wing On Company at the peak of its success in 1930 Shanghai, or how to fight in the Chinese Civil War, or just how to chat to old timers in the back streets of Shecky. In South Flows the Pearl, we truly get both sides of the Chinese Australian story. We travel with these men and women back and forth between Australia and China, sometimes many times in one lifetime, on ships with familiar names to anyone who's looked at uh, Chinese and Australian history, names like the Chang Te or the Taiping or the SS Tanda. We mourn with these families when war and revolution make this travel impossible leading to famine in some villages, leading to family separation and the end of remittances, leading to the loss of treasured homes and rice fields acquired over generations through the hard work of Chinese Australian families. We mourn also in peacetime in Australia when Chinatowns are demolished in the post-war period to provide lands for white soldier settlers, when husbands and wives are threatened with deportation, as was the case with Chinese seaman Don Yinlo uh, Cheryl Yinlo's father and Evelyn Yinlo's husband under the Wartime Refugees Removal Act of 1949. Luckily, he was eventually able to stay and the family flourished in the 1950s. Because there is so much to celebrate here as well. Evelyn Yinlo, Cheryl Yinlo's mom, having a birthday party in the back lanes of Surrey Hills in the 1930s and inviting the neighborhood kids, Frank Lee G, half Italian, half Chinese Australian, joining the Chinese Youth League and finding a warm community there. And finally, there is the success and cultural riches brought by all of the so-called new Chinese migrants who came at the end of World War II, from Papua New Guinea, from Indonesia, from Malaysia, and of course, from Hong Kong. 
This really is Australian history in a Chinese context. And it is no small thing. In fact, I want to suggest it's quite a radical way of looking at history. When I was first trained as a historian in the 2000s, there was a real push to start acknowledging the contribution of Chinese migrants to Australia's past, led in part by men and women in the Chinese Australian Historical Society. This push happened in tandem with calls for a greater understanding of Australia's Indigenous past. But how to do this? How to really change what is written or not written in Australian history textbooks? How to take Chinese Australian history and place it at the heart of what it means to be Australian? So it's my job to teach Australian history here at the University of Sydney. And in fact, I often run what are called big survey courses on modern Australian history. A survey, a survey course is meant to convey all that is important about Australian history. What were the key moments? Who were the key individuals? Obviously, like this map up here, that involves choosing what to highlight and what to leave out, elevating certain events over others, elevating certain groups and individuals over others. In Australian history, generally speaking, this has meant that much of our past has been dictated by what mattered in Europe and America, what mattered in the English speaking world. So you think about your basic Australian history textbook. Here is a timeline from one uh, sort of uh, widely used Australian history textbook. <clears throat> as, as historians, we are taught to take all the messiness of history and place it into neat linear frames that can begin to under so that we can begin to understand it all to make sense of the past. But where are Chinese Australians in this Australian story? Their lives bridged two countries, China and Australia. Their lives were tied less to events in Europe and America and more to events in Asia. Their lives were as affected by this timeline up here, the first timeline I'm gonna show you as by this timeline. The dates we choose to elevate in history matter, and the choice is a powerful one. It sends a message. Think about the 26th of January in Australia, for example. So where really are Chinese Australians in Australian history writing? In Australian history, based on a Euro-American Euro model, we call the 1920s and 1930s the interwar period, the period between World War I and World War II. But surely for Chinese Australians, the interwar period was anything but. This was a period of conflict in South China, of banditry, of failed government and little law and order, of kidnapping and threats to property, especially for families receiving remittances. Overseas Chinese often carried guns and families fled to Hong Kong lest their children were kidnapped for ransom. In Shanghai, many Chinese Australian families experienced success, but it was a, it was a fragile success and the managers of companies such as the Wing On Company wore bulletproof vests to work. You can read about, about that in South Flows the Pearl. There was Japanese colonialism, of course, beginning in Manchuria in the 1930s and then invasion and then terror. This was no interwar period. Mavis's interviewees weave these two timelines together. For the men and women Mavis interviewed, 1911 was as important as 1914, World War II truly began in 1937, not 1939, as in most Australian history textbooks. And the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong was as seismic as Pearl Harbor. But Mavis's interviews do more than this. They take events usually told from a white Australian perspective and they reveal the limitations of this view. I teach a course at Sydney Uni on the Great Depression in Australia. I teach that during the Great Depression, 30% of Australians were unemployed. I teach about extreme poverty and how some families may do on large unemployment camps such as Happy Valley and La Perouse. When I introduce race into the discussion, I talk about the stolen generations and the policy of assimilation for Indigenous Australians. To my knowledge, and to date, no Australian history textbook discusses the impact of the Great Depression on Chinese Australians, but Mavis did. In the early 1990s, Mavis interviewed Hoi Lee from Stuart Town near Wellington in regional New South Wales, an old gold mining area. Hoi Lee was born in 1911. He's at the top left of um, the screen here. 
His father was Wong Wei Lei and had been brought out to work for Fong, the Fong Lian Company in Wellington in the 1880s. In 1903, he married and brought his wife, Lung Dai Wong, and they set up their own shop in Stewart Town near Wellington, a place called Yi Lian Company. Hoi Li worked the shop during the Great Depression. The picture he painted of Depression era life was not one I had seen before. I'm just quoting from Hoi Li here in South Flows the Pearl. The doll started in about 1929 when the depression began, not for Chinese because they couldn't get the doll. During the depression, a lot of young Australians came from Sydney to Stewart Town to live because it was an old gold mining area. They would get the doll each fortnight and between they do a bit of gold bossicking. Hoy remembered his brother trying to organize the pension for Chinese market gardeners from Wellington affected by the Great Depression. Um, this is also, this is Hoy again. He was a justice of the peace and they could talk to him. They weren't game to ask anyone else. He used to do a lot of that work. Some didn't apply because they came to Australia and with someone else's paperwork. I asked one man I knew why he wasn't retired as he was almost 70. He said he'll never be able to get to retiring age of 65 as his paperwork says he was only around 40 years old. Hoy remembered the returned soldiers um, during the Great Depression as well, who he treated with great kindness. He says, some of the blokes around Stewart Town were returned from World War I. Their nerves were gone. They were honest blokes, but their nerves were gone from the war. Hoy remembered large families of Eurasians who also struggled through the Depression. He said we called them Sapyat Bim, or not quite the full dozen, not quite 11. So this is not the Great Depression my students know. This is not the Great Depression I know. This Great Depression did not place white people and their poverty at the center. This Great Depression was racially and ethnically complex, placing survival at its heart and true to the varied racial ties running through most communities in 1930s Australia. This was a shift away from Eurocentric history. This was a new way to tell the story. There are many examples of this new Australian history in South Flows the Pearl. There is Chinese Australian Luang Pui, who was trapped in Hong Kong in 1941 and responsible for his extended family. You can see Luang Pui here as a student on the far left. His escape from Hong Kong, assisted by sanitation workers and friendly fishermen under Japanese fire, is one of the most remarkable wartime stories I've ever read. I won't read you this whole description, but you can have a look at it here. <clears throat> Here is what Mavis wrote about Long Pui. She wrote, Long Pui's wartime experiences reveal the role of human relationships and lineage ties in the functioning of the Pearl River Delta village society. Following the Japanese defeat and surrender in 1945, the post-war liberalization of Australia's immigration policy allowed Long Pui the opportunity to come to Australia in 1951 when an uncle in Sydney sponsored him to work in a new restaurant. You can read a little bit of, um, Long Pui's amazing story up here. In July, 2020, I joined Richard and Shaman at Rookwood Cemetery in Sydney to look for graves. Rookwood is so large that it's called Sydney's sleeping city. We are like tiny ants moving through a million graves. Hoi Lee is buried here as is Long Pui and Evelyn and Don Yin Lo. At Rookwood, we find the grave of another of Mavis's interviewees, a man called Lee Singh. Lee came from a village in Lungdu. He was the third generation of his family to come to Australia as Lee Singh's grandfather, father, and two uncles came to Queensland before him. He died in 1989, the year a whole new generation of Chinese migrants, the Tiananmen generation would depart China for Australia. There are three photographs on his headstone. Lee's photo has been placed next to his two wives. His second wife, Lam Tim Yuk, was born the year of the 1911 revolution and died in 1996. And his first wife, Xiao Kim He, was born during China's 100 Days Reforms in 1898 and died in 1930. Richard, Xiaoman and I are touched. Xiao Kim He died in the village the year after the Wall Street crash and a year before the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, far from Wookwood, far from Australia. She died so young, so long ago. But presumably on Lee Sing's instructions, his family included her photograph on the headstone, despite the absence of her body. Mavis, of course, recorded Lee Sing's story. So we have far more than just this headstone. We have his voice, we have his perspective, recorded by Mavis when Lee Sing was 95 years old. 
Mavis is not buried at Rookwood. She rests with her brother Harry and her two sisters, Edna and Sheila, in the northern suburbs crematorium on Sydney's North Shore. While writing South Flows the Pearl, she penned the following words. They are hopeful, they are proud, and they stake a claim for Chinese Australians in this country's history, to quote from Mavis. The history of the Chinese in Australia is almost as long as this country's own modern history. Their descendants can now look back with pride at the contribution made by their forefathers, which today is finally being made known. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, to all our panelists today, to Sophie, Cam and Richard um, for their really fascinating um, introduction to this book. For anyone who's interested in purchasing the book with the discount code, there is a link in the chat. Um, you need to click through to the checkout and then you'll see the discount code is applied um, there. So go all the way to the checkout and that's where you'll see it. Um, unfortunately, we've um, run a bit over time, so I don't know if we'll have time for Q&A, but I just wanted to read one comment that came in um, during your panel that I thought was just um, really touching and speaks to the impact of this book already in this, in this small forum here. So Cecilia wrote, I migrated to Sydney 45 years this year. I've been lucky to enjoy all the results that our Chinese ancestors hardworking contributed to our Australian society, but I rarely have a chance to pay much attention to our community's history. Now I have grandchildren and I'm retired. Um, this program has inspired me to write something about how our family ended up rooting on this golden soil land. Um, so I think that speaks to what um, an important project this is and how fantastic it is that, that um, this book has been published after, as Richard said, really years of labor across multiple generations. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Do purchase your copy with the um, discount code uh, there in the chat. Um, and hopefully you'll join us uh, for future events in this series. Thank you.